a place with abundant water, the first such place we'd seen for a long time. It was Posoteng Nor, a lake southwest of the Tian Shan Mountains and on the edge of the Takla Makan Desert. It's about 1,300 kilometers square, or about 800 miles. The small rivers that flow from the mountains form a sort of delta as they flow into Posoteng Nor. Because it provides a never-ending supply of water, and because it's so beautiful, the people here call the lake the Pearl of the Desert. We traveled 60 kilometers or 40 miles to the southwest of the lake into a plain below a spur of the Tian Shan Mountains that juts into the desert. The road here winds its way between steep cliffs that almost seem to touch the sky. It passes through Tian Men Chun, said to be the most formidable mountain pass in the whole world. There's a proverb which says that one man can hold this pass against 10,000. It was the most important fortification on the South Tian Shan section of the Silk Road. This part of the road, which runs between the Tian Shan Mountains to the north and the Takla Makan Desert in the south, is today part of the main trunk route across the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Three hundred kilometers, or 180 miles west of the pass, we came to Kucha, the biggest oasis on this part of the Silk Road. Kucha, which used to be called the land of Guizhi, was a prosperous place and a sort of crossroad between east and west. Halfway along the Tian Shan Road, it was a great empire, and ancient documents talk about a castle as big as the one in Chang'an and a grand and elegant palace. We found vehicles pulled by mules, which they call Kucha buses. It only costs about seven American cents to ride the bus. This day, they were doing good business because it was market day. And families all in their best clothes were crowding into the town center. The population of Kucha is about 340,000, and most of the people are Uyghurs. Their favorite food is pieces of mutton cooked on skewers and called shish kebab. One skewer only costs a couple of cents. We were told that during the past couple of years, the variety of things available in this market has become much greater than ever before. When we were there, the most popular item seemed to be nylon clothing. We thought of the long distant past, when the market must have offered glass goblets and rolls of beautiful silk. In those days, people must have been attracted by the beautiful music, and the foreign merchants must have praised their wares in many languages, including Persian and even Greek.
Our guide told us that Kucha is famous for two things, music and wonderful fruit. The water from the melting snow makes the fruit trees grow strong, and the dry desert air makes the fruit sweet. The men folk gather here in one corner of the market where they can relax while their wives are shopping. For the market is a place of pleasure as well as business. At about five o'clock in the afternoon, the market ends, and the Kucha buses take everybody home. July is harvest time in Kucha, and here and there you can hear people singing harvest songs from the countryside. The sun has given us fine crops. The sun has bestowed on us its favors. That's why we're so happy now. On this peaceful threshing floor, people are singing too. The ancient music of Kucha is believed to have traveled eastwards along the Silk Road and even crossed the sea to Japan, where it influenced the ancient court music called Gigaku, which can still occasionally be heard today. And music is still an important part of the lives of the people of Kutschak. Here in the shade of a stand of poplar trees by the side of a field where women are working is a place where the children can sleep. They're singing an ancient lullaby that has come down through the ages. When they've half finished the harvest, you can hear lively music from various parts of the village. They're dancing in honor of the harvest, and the music, which is called mushrop, has been handed down since ancient days.
It's accompanied by a drum called dup, a two-string fiddle called dota, and a 13-string instrument called a satar. Everybody, from the youngest child to the oldest person, can dance the mashrap, which is the pride of the people of Kucha. They're always looking for an excuse to sing and dance. And the harvest time is a good opportunity to enjoy themselves. When they dance the mashrap, they express their joy with their whole bodies. During the interval, when the people are resting from the dance, various kinds of entertainment are offered. This is the tray dance. You have to dance so you don't drop the samovar or the bowls on the tray. Many things were brought here along the Silk Road from far off Persia, and perhaps this was one of them. Twenty kilometers or twelve miles northeast of the town, on both banks of the upper reaches of the Kucha River, lie the biggest group of Buddhist ruins in all the western lands. This is called Subashi Castle. When Xuanzang visited Kucha at the beginning of the seventh century, he wrote. The beauty of the Buddhist images here almost exceeds the possibilities of human hands. He wrote of the temples as being so beautiful that they didn't seem to belong to this world. You can still see many caves in the cliffside that faces the river. This is where new priests underwent their training. Chu and Zhang wrote that the priests were very strict in their observation of Buddhist law and that they were pure and dedicated. He praised the serious attitude they took to their training. Like the moon, like the sun, O oh great benevolent Buddha, Please bestow on the Kucha River an eternal flow of water, an affluent growth of our crops. The prayers of people who lived in the desert must often have echoed through this vast temple.
In 1903, a Japanese expedition called the Otani Expedition made an interesting discovery near here. They found an ancient wooden box that had been used as a sort of reliquary to hold the bones of a holy man. It seemed to be only black, but when the black paint was removed, it was found to have been painted with a picture of an ancient orchestra in bright colors. It's one of the world's rarest Buddhist treasures. In the orchestra, you can see a big drum, a harp and a flute. And there are people dancing. It gives you an idea what the ancient Kucha music must have been like. There are many other Buddhist ruins near Kucha, and in fact it's recorded that there were more than 100 temples and 5,000 priests altogether, making Kucha the biggest Buddhist city of the Western lands. One of the most important ruins are the Kumtura Thousand Buddha Caves, about 30 kilometers or 18 miles to the west of the modern town. So far, archaeologists have discovered 106 caves cut into the wall of a cliff overhanging the Mazat River. To get to them, you have to climb a steep and dangerous path. One of the experts encouraged us to climb a cliff about 200 meters high or 600 feet to see what he said was a clear picture of angels performing music like the Japanese gigaku. Cave number 46, which was built from the 4th to the 5th centuries. The murals with a history of 1,500 years behind them are already discolored with only the contours of the Buddhist images remaining black. Far inside, we can see the picture of the angels playing gigaku. One of them is playing a four-stringed instrument which you can still find in Japan where it's called biwa. Another was playing on a set of pan pipes. At the time this painting was made, the biwa and pan pipes must have been the most important instruments. Halfway up the cliff is a row of five holes connected by a long corridor-like cave inside. There's an interesting legend about this corridor. They say that Xuan Zhang preached the teachings of Buddha here when he came at the beginning of the 17th century. The people still call it the teaching place. Written on the walls of one of these caves are inscriptions in Tokarian, the ancient Kucha language, quite different from the Uyghur tongue they speak today. The characters have still not been completely deciphered, but enough has been discovered to show that Tokarian was related to Latin and Greek, languages from even further west than Persia.
and the faces of the bodhisattvas, the Buddhist saints, are quite Western in appearance. Perhaps they were like the faces of the people of Kucha at the time that Xuan Zan visited them, almost 1300 years ago. But who they were, and exactly what language they spoke, are still mysteries. For the ancient Kucha Empire was destroyed at the end of the 8th century by people who came from Tibet. The Uyghurs, who are of Turkic origin, originally settled here at about the beginning of the 9th century. Since that time, they have intermarried with many other peoples to become the Kucha Uyghurs of today. A song and dance troupe from Kucha came to visit the People's Corporation to the northwest of the town. <laughs> the group was made up of 22 women and 25 men, and it tours the various People's Corporations in this area. The people gathered eagerly at the local theatre at six that evening to watch the performance. This sort of entertainment is their greatest treat. Now they're dancing a popular dance called the beautiful Kucha Maid. Both words and music have been handed down through the ages from ancient times. The song and dance troupe has also tried to revive some of the ancient Buddhist dances. They follow the hints on the walls of the Thousand Buddha Caves and base the music on old folk songs. When the performance was over, we went backstage to talk to the artists. We wanted to find out more about the ancient music that has come to Japan from Kucha via Chang'an.
Here are some photographs of old Japanese musical instruments. This is a five-string biwa. Do you have something like this among the musical instruments you're using? No, we don't. This is a four-stringed biwa. Do you have something like this one? No, no, we don't. This one is called kuko. Do you have a musical instrument like this? No, no, we don't. This one is called kakko. How about it? Do you have anything like it? No, we don't. This is called yoko. How about it? No. And this one is a flute. How about that? Oh, I think I've seen something like that before. You've just heard the sound of the five-string biwa, the only musical instrument of its kind remaining in the world. It's preserved in the Shōsōin, the imperial treasure house of Japan, in which ancient articles from the 7th and 8th centuries are kept. That was a recording made in 1952 when the instrument was played just on that one occasion. By the way, the sound you just heard, which of the musical instruments that the Uyghur people have do you think sounds like what you just heard? Do you think you have any instrument that sounds like it? Yes, the tambura. Ah, oh, the tambura indeed. Yes, it does sound like it. It sure does. We heard about an old woman called Nisa Han who was said to be able to sing a very old song. So we went to see her in a house which she shares with her brother. Nisa Han is 75 years old. They sang for us a song that was popular about 200 years ago. It's called Maiden Lovely as the Moon.
10 kilometers or six miles west of the town is a salty river, which the people call the Salt River Canyon because it's dry most of the year. It usually only flows during the flood season in August. The dry riverbed is covered with a whitish saline deposit. About 500 meters or a quarter of a mile from the Saltwater Canyon is a hilly area which contains the Kurosugaha Buddhist Caves. There are 46 of them, and they were built in the 3rd and 4th centuries AD. We entered the 30th cave. We put some questions to the professor who was with us. But professor, is there anything to see? Oh, yes. But there's nothing right here. No, not here, a, a bit further inside. Ah, yes, I see. Yes, there are some remains. The instruments the angels are playing on are called vertical kuko, or harps. The kuko originated in ancient Assyria. This instrument has a bent neck and four strings. It's a kind of lute from Persia. It's quite well known in Japan, and it's still used to accompany the recitation of ancient epics. This is the haisho, an ancient Chinese instrument. Here, because of the damage to the mural, you can't see exactly what instrument's being played. However, from the position of the hands, it's probably what the Japanese call a hichiriki, a kind of flute that was invented in kucha. It's very important in gigaku music. In mid-July, we were lucky enough to be able to watch a Uyghur wedding. The bride arrives in a truck, and with her entourage and a band, goes in a procession to the groom's house. Behind the band come two pairs of attendants, the bride's parents, and all her relatives and friends in order. The bride is completely invisible behind a thick veil, and she is carried on a rich carpet.
In front of the groom's house, she's carried across a fire to show how she'll face the problems of married life. As soon as she reaches her husband's house, the new bride bursts into tears. She's only 18 years old, and her name is Marigri Abora. Now the veil has been taken off to show that she's the wife in this house and that this is her room. Now she will always stay with her husband and never leave him. The musician sings a wedding song and the cousin of the bride dances. While the bride's relations are dancing, the musicians sing, and in the garden, the celebrations of the groom's party are reaching a high point. The groom is 23 years old. His name is Baikri Sleek, and he has been courting Marigri for a whole year. The go-between proposes a toast to the happy pair in a merry song, which is said to dispel all care. Singing and dancing seem almost necessary to the lives of the people of Kucha. Next, we wanted to see the biggest group of Buddhist caves in the Western lands. They're called the Kisil Caves. And to find them, we traveled 60 kilometers, 40 miles, up the Saltwater Canyon, northwest of the town. We emerged from the canyon and traveling across the desert soon came to a hilly area and a line of cliffs along the Mazat River. It's here that the Kisil Buddhist caves are to be found. There are 236 caves and they extend for about two kilometers or a mile along the cliffside. They were built at various times between the 3rd and 9th centuries. As a treasure trove of Buddhist art, they're regarded as second only to the famous caves at Dunhuang. They form one of the most wonderful sights on the whole of the Silk Road. Cave number 38 is halfway up the cliffside, and we were told that it dates from some time in the third or fourth centuries AD. The frescoes on the ceiling give you some idea of the glories of ancient Buddhist art. At the end of a long corridor leading inwards is an image of the Shakyamuni Nirvana, the historical Buddha in a state of religious ecstasy. Over the entrance is painted the Maitreya Bodhisattva, 
the Buddha of the future, who will come to rescue mankind after more than 5,000 million years have passed. Around him, the frescoes show the past, the present, and the future, all combined in one bold design. When this great painting is examined closely, it proves to be typical of the art of the Western lands. At the center, you can see the two-headed eagle, who will plead for mankind. And the Buddha himself sits in the middle of a pattern of diamond shapes, seeming to preach to the person sitting next to him. You can't find patterns of diamonds like this at Dunhuang, and it's believed to have come from Persia, far to the west. There are also angels with wings, another western motif. On the ceiling are painted the lives of the historical Buddha. It shows him being reborn many times, sometimes as an animal, sometimes as a deity. With each birth, he stores up more and more merit until finally he is born as the Buddha. Later, we found that this cave was called the Music Cave by a group of Germans who came in an expedition at the beginning of the century. You can see that angels are playing all kinds of instruments, lutes, harps and flutes, as well as many other kinds we'd seen before. For the Japanese, it was very interesting to see these instruments for they're all either still used today in the Gigaku music, or else you can find them in the Sho Soin, the famous 8th century imperial treasure house. Then we saw, at a height of about 5 meters, or 16 feet, a painting of a lute with five strings, an unusual type, but exactly the same as one preserved in the Shōzō Inn, regarded as one of Japan's most important national treasures. came originally from India, traveled across the mountains of Pamir, the Taklamakan Desert, Chang'an, and all the way to Japan. And here was its picture, hidden in the darkness of a Buddhist cave. This is a song of love sung by the people of the deserts. The people of Kucha no longer use many of the ancient instruments you can see in the caves, but they still love singing and dancing, as they always have. When Xu Zan had ended his journey to India and back in search of Buddhist scriptures in the 7th century, after covering 25,000 kilometers, 15,000 miles, he wrote, 
The instrumental music of Kucha, called Gigaku, is superior to that of any other country. Today, 1300 years later, the people of Kucha still preserve their ancient musical heritage.